Hi, I'm Stephen. And I'm Celine from the Cult Hackers podcast. So I'm a former member of a high control group, otherwise known as a cult, who left when I was about 30. That's about the time my daughter was born. That's you, Celine. We explore what it's like to be in a cult and leave one. We interview former members and leading cult experts. And we also talk about the long journey of making sense of the world afterwards. Yeah, that's a journey that you've witnessed and helped me with. I'm a media graduate interested in the place cults have in our society. And I'm an organisational psychologist these days with an interest in leadership and who also studies cults and cultic groups. There's a new episode every week where we look at cults from every angle and attempt to crack the cult code. So search for Cult Hackers on your favourite podcast app and catch up with us every Saturday. Hello listeners and welcome to part two in this mini-series on Xenos Christian Fellowship. In part one, Emma talked us through her early involvement in the group, and in part two we will discuss Emma's furthering involvement in Xenos before her eventual escape. For early access to ad-free full-length episodes, you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. But for now, here is Emma. When you mentioned that the church felt like they were above certain things or that certain things couldn't happen to them Mm. was there ever a time where a leadership's child fell ill and they had to explain around kind of contradicting themselves on their messages I'm sure I mean they I don't think that they ever attributed things like that to the punishment of God necessarily. Um, But really it's just that they, their actions go unchecked, their character, the way that they treat people goes unchecked. And there have been situations where that's been really bad. I mean, this is, this hasn't been talked about in the media that I know of, but one of the um, main leaders at one point was cheating on his wife with several young girls that were her disciplers in in his own home church he was you know pursuing them sexually and some of them were consenting I think some of them weren't I think some of them were groomed and manipulated I don't know the entire story but again that wasn't addressed legally they just turned on that leader and said you know you have to get out of here basically and they haven't taken ownership for that either That was just a him problem. That wasn't a leadership problem. But I mean, it's the direct effect of them shaming other people, but never taking responsibility for anything themselves. When it goes unchecked for so long, you can get away with anything. Perhaps that would also encourage predators to step into or remain in that environment if they realize that there really isn't any consequence or repercussion for them carrying out their horrific actions within that type of of church setting yeah and I mean I don't know how much sexual abuse is going on I know of a few instances but when it comes to emotional psychological spiritual abuse Everybody that I've talked to that has left has experienced that firsthand uh, for many years, actually. So um, I think, yeah, it definitely does allow opportunity for predators, whether that's sexually or other forms of abuse. So once you moved into the communal home, do you remember that day? Do you remember packing your bags and actually walking out of your home? Kind of. <laughs> um, I was already kind of living there for the the summer before that. Uh, I was just spending all my time there and I didn't want to be around my parents because we were in conflict about me going. And um, so it was, I was kind of already moved in. I don't t- know, know if I remember the exact day. Did you already know which room you'd be in, how many people you might be sharing that room with, who these people were? Yes. Um, My first ministry house, the answer is yes. Um, 
But following that, I mean, it's not uncommon to move once or twice a year when you're living in a ministry house. And I think the the most amount of people I lived with was four, 14 girls with one bathroom, one kitchen. Um, and, you know, the ministry houses aren't owned by Xenos, but they are run by them. They're led by them. So when they say, lie to your landlord about how many people are living there, we say, okay. If they say, you guys have to move in the next month, find a place, we say, okay. Um, if they say, we're going to move in another four people to your house uh, in a week, we say, okay. So I knew the people I was moving in with initially, but that was not, that's, that was the, uh, that was uncommon for being in a ministry house. So oftentimes you didn't know where you were going to live, who you were going to live with. There were, you know, three, four people in a room. There was no privacy at all and really no control of your life. And you're 16 at this point. Some people would say that that's really still a child. You're definitely a young adult at this point. Was there anything in place to protect you from potential abuses that you found yourself living with? No. Um, I mean, no, but yes. I mean, the whole system of Xenos is based on reporting to other people. So everybody knows what's going on with everybody at all times. Even if you're not in the same group, you know the dirt on other people. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question. It's like we were surveilled, but there wasn't necessarily anything put in place legally or like in writing to protect me. It was just, there was a contract actually, it was called a covenant for the communal living house that um, it was basically like language where you agreed to being a a perfect spiritual Christian person. And if you didn't abide by that, they could kick you out at any, at any time. So when you were moved from one house to another, were your parents made aware of this? Did you let them know or would you mention it to them at one of these regular services that you were all expected to attend? Or was it a, a real breakdown of communication at that point? Um, I mean, I would tell them. But like sometimes we would only know two weeks beforehand. So they were just kind of like, all right, at that point, my sister, I think there was one year that she moved four times. Uh, So (laughs) there's, you know, there's an area that we were all kind of uh, concentrated in, but it was just kind of another thing for my parents, just as if I were to tell them, like, I went to a different coffee shop the other day, like I'm moving again, you know. The decision behind the communal homes was all based on 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 deciphering and and going to recruit more members of the church. I think it, it it's based on like just living your life with other people that are in the congregation. Uh, so a lot of it's a lot about uh, accountability. It's a lot about like, I mean, one of the things that one of the messages that I heard a lot is that if you wanted time to yourself, it was that was selfish. Being autonomous was a very negative thing. Um, You never wanted to be viewed as being like too independent because it was communicated to us that that was against God's uh, design for us. Yeah, even if it was just living in a different place. So I think the, yeah, the, the initial purpose was just to have accountability and community in a very extreme way. Um, but yeah, also like having a a, a house full of, of 10 women who are love bombing a stranger makes them, you know, wonder like, how are these people so nice? Why are they so good to me? they just hang out all the time in this party house. And, you know, maybe I should go out to their meeting because they're so nice. But then it's a a different story once they actually join. I mentioned that it was also around this time that you were taken on 
leadership training as well. Do you remember what age you were when you completed that training, what the training looked like and how you then went into action as a leader? So um, I started leading in the high school group before I even started the leadership training classes. Um, And then I quickly became a house leader in the college group when I was 17. So before I could even like tell a landlord that I wanted to sign the lease because I mean, most people weren't on the lease anyway, because we were all lying, but, um, but yeah, I was a leader of the house when I was 17 too. And I, I don't think I was in leadership training classes then either. Um, but it was for the college group, it was every Wednesday night and it was a privilege and it was around three hours, I think, um, of talking through, different concepts about uh, the Bible and how they applied to Xenos. Um, and there were, some, there were some interesting exercises. We would do church visits and basically just critique the churches and talk about how they were so much shittier than us and we were better than everyone else. And um, But then there were also, there was a, um, like a morality exercise or like an ethics exercise almost where the teacher would say some sinful behavior and then every member of the class would have to rate it out of five about like how sinful it was. Um, And it was such bullshit. Like people would be like getting drunk and they'd be like five. It's so fucked up five, you know, and then they'd be like pride. It's like a two, but it's like really the pride is, ruining people's lives and getting drunk is not very consequential. Um, so yeah, there, I mean, the classes lasted for, so it was like, there were six levels, like you could go through leadership training class one through six, but six was only for people who are sitting in on leaders meetings already. Um, so if, if each of those is like a semester then I don't know how many years that is or maybe it was a a quarter I don't remember but yeah um yeah and I went through everything before I left um even LTC6 uh yeah I don't know I haven't I still have the material here somewhere I haven't looked through it in a while but um there were classes that I took too that went over how being gay is a sin and um I was going to ask actually about the the uh, LGBTQIA plus community because you mentioned pride and then you said that pride is killing people and then it took me a second to realize that you mean the sin of pride and not the pride as in as in you know going going out to celebrate the lgbt community for a second i was like why would she say that and then i was like oh i realized the pride of sin uh, the sin of pride sorry so what would the church look like for somebody that identified as a member of the lgbt community mm-hmm. um so one of my best friends is gay and she left the church she was actually my disciples disciple so i was like her grandma and child disciple. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah um but we are like best friends now and she is um she's living with her girlfriend and they're so in love and I really love her and um but her experience was terrible obviously um going into dwell she knew that people didn't accept gay people. The thing is that, you know, we say, we would say like, oh, God loves everybody. God loves, you know, God loves everyone. He doesn't, you know, everything, everything's a sin. Everyone's sinful. Like it's not just being gay, but then when you got in it, it was like totally unacceptable. If you wanted to move into the ministry house, or if you wanted to go to cell group, or if you wanted to take a leadership training class, you could not be gay. Absolutely not. Um, and, and they viewed it as a choice, you know, they wouldn't call it being gay. They called it same sex attraction. And so everybody has attractions, but, um, it's what, like how you act on it is what they said. But, um, my friend, I mean, she, she wouldn't mind me telling her story, but 
she uh, told people that she was attracted to women, but she was like, it's not a big deal. Like, that's not who I am. Um, you know, just kind of whatever. She even tried to date men at one point and I tried to set her up with somebody. Um, but she ended up being outed to everyone. I mean, every, like I said, everybody knew everything about everyone. And so she was outed and the way that she was outed too, was like this really gross perspective of, of gay people, which I think that the church has in general, which basically her disciple told everybody, all the women before a a retreat that we went on to be careful around her because she was gay. So we should be careful, like changing around her or being in, you know, bathing suits or things like that because she's gay. And so just a very like, uh, shaming message that, you know, essentially because she's attracted to the same sex, she's dangerous to be around, which is so gross. So gross. Oh my gosh. Um, but she, uh, she left after having a surprise intervention about her uh, sexual orientation where they were like, if you love God, then why are you gay, essentially? And she left after that. Um, oh, that's horrible. And, yeah. And I mean, since has just grown so much. Like, she's so strong. She's so courageous. She knows who she is now and she loves herself for it and like has just this really beautiful life that she's constantly telling me that she's never been happier. So happy ending, but that's how gay people are treated in the church. Well, I'm happy to hear that that person is thriving outside of a repressive, homophobic, transphobic environment. And to any people that are existing within this church that identify as as queer, as gay, as trans, as pansexual or gender fluid. I hope that every person gets the opportunity to live authentically to their orientation, whatever that may be, outside of this church environment. Unless the church really wants to take a look at itself and realise that if you're going to have 12 women living in a house together, there's a chance that some of them might end up in relationships with each other or some of them might be attracted to each other because that's just how the world works. So you mentioned that sleep was really not something that was encouraged in the group. Actually, it felt almost like Xenos didn't want you to get much sleep. And that's definitely how it sounds after all of the activities and obligations you've listed. Mm-hmm. Were there any other things that you feel you were restricted in? I mean, leisure time, I'm sure there's not much time for you mentioned free time. And I was thinking, well, what would well, free time? I'm... <laughs> right. You, you, right. You know, oh, you get you you get to move move up in the church. And when you move up in the church, you get more free time. And I was thinking, well, I feel like that's kind of like a, a dangling carrot that doesn't come to right. fruition <laughs> right. um, and then also just wondering about things like your diet your clothing were you restricted in any way with any of those things I've written here relationships but I think it it's obvious that it goes without saying that that too was not encouraged yeah I, I like just to clarify I wouldn't say you get more free time as you uh it uh what's the word as you progress in Xenos, um, but you get more freedom. So like less people breathing down your neck, right. less people checking in on you. Right. Um, that thing, I think that might've been the word you used and I've misinterpreted it as free time. Whereas actually it's just less surveillance. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. But sleep was a big thing. Um, I mean, we would be outright like shamed publicly and, if we said we wanted to get a full eight hours of sleep, um, they said it was selfish and, um, kind of taking away time that the Lord could use you. Um, but yeah, I think like dress was, it was a thing for, like a little bit, uh, where we were told like women were told at certain times that like clothing, like leggings or something were like stumbling to the men that we should, we would like stop wearing them at certain times. I also, 
I argued with one of my leaders for over an hour after she confronted me about the provocative quote unquote way that I was sitting, which I was essentially just like man spreading, you know, like just not sitting with my legs together. Um, and she was, she, you know, she told me how that was inappropriate and inconsiderate of me. And I just argued with her like for over an hour about how ridiculous that was. We even, we, there was even a girl that we policed like one specific member of our home church. Um, we policed her so strictly that we like had a, a code to signal to her a code word that when she would seemed like too sexy in front of people, even if we like couldn't explain how we, we would just basically be like, stop doing that. Stop standing that way. Um, so that was part of it, but, but really the biggest way that we were restricted was with decision-making and this could be like a whole separate episode's worth of content, honestly, but um, the shame and morality that dwell tied to decision-making has been one of the most difficult things for me to unlearn. Um, we were expected to run our decisions, both large and small decisions, past a slew of people before taking action on anything. And uh, if they, if we didn't do that, or if we disagreed with the quote unquote wise counsel that we received from people about our decision, then you were accused of being unwilling to seek counsel or unwilling to listen to wise counsel. You were called prideful and selfish and autonomous. And that was probably one of the, the those were the biggest labels that I got in Xenos because if you can't already tell I'm I've been willing I like I was willing to stand up to the leaders and tell them I think that this is weird or I don't agree with this or you know I would still bring them my decisions because that's just how things worked but sometimes I just wouldn't agree with the counsel that they would give me and so I got called all those names all the time especially towards the end feel like somebody picking up on the way that you're sitting is perhaps the observer's issue and not yours right maybe she was attracted to me <laughs> I mean I, I but who knows it, maybe I feel like a lot of people in in these positions of of power where they exert certain things over people is merely a reflection of their true desires or their true wants in life but maybe that's just mm -hmm. an observation on my part and what would happen if you were to go against any of these things you've mentioned there that there were times where you would stand up to leadership where you would question things where you would disagree with things what what would happen if you were continuously not attending services or not coming to live in the house or moving out of the communal house or not taking off those leggings yeah well I think that there would be different levels of consequences for each of those things which we can definitely talk about um but I think generally the biggest mode of control would was shame so either privately or publicly, um, you would be shamed for going against the status quo. Um, I mean, I personally have been part of many like surprise interventions as well as group confessions, but that they were co like that were coerced. Um, and the goal was to confront somebody about how sinful they were for not doing it the xenos way um which i mean it could be it's as inconsequential as like accidentally having too much to drink and you would find yourself in a coerced group confession or a surprise intervention about it um i mean we can definitely talk about this as we continue the 
the podcast, but uh, I personally, one of the big reasons I left is because I said I didn't want to live in the ministry house anymore. And I can tell you firsthand the consequences of that. But, but really, I mean, yeah, it could be as small as being shamed privately, but as big as literally losing everything in your life. I had a, a friend who went against something that Dwell considered inappropriate, or he did something that Dwell seemed in, considered inappropriate. And um, they convinced his girlfriend to break up with him when he was about to propose. They kicked him out of the ministry house without notice. He ended up losing his job, which was at Dwell. And then he was asked to leave the home church and go to an adult group. And he, when he was asked to go to a different group, he was like, no, I don't want to do that. He was like, my entire life just got turned upside down. Like I lost my fiance. I lost my job. I lost my house. Like, I don't want to go to a different group of people that don't know me at all that I have no history with. And then he just got an email the next week from uh, a member of the adult group saying, hey, we heard you wanted to check out groups. So he's still there now. He's in an adult group. But I just explained that to drive the point home that you could lose your entire life. You could lose everything. Just by not going with what leadership tell you to go with. Wow, right. that's heartbreaking. That is, that's really upsetting to hear that. And his his and partner his, was was in the church, and she was encouraged right. by the church to wow. And and in his case, he knew that what he was doing would ruin his life, so he tried to hide it. Which I can't imagine how much strain that put on him emotionally too. And then his worst nightmare came true, and he lost everything. Oh, that's so sad and he's still still there as far as I know yeah so you mentioned that there were a few things that started happening towards your the lead up to your departure from the church was there one specific event where you just said okay no that's it I I can't do this anymore um no. It's funny talking to people about how they left because a lot of people, there was one thing or it was this thing over time where they were realizing that this is what's being taught there. What's being done there is wrong. But for me, when I look back on it, it was more so just a trauma response than a well thought out decision or a reaction to something in like specifically, I think that there were a couple things that really solidified in my mind. Like I can't be here, but then it was just a flip of a switch where I was like, I have to leave right now. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, one of those things was, uh, the way that they handled COVID and the shutdown, it was very black and white, you know, a moral issue, um, very controlling of what people's opinions should be and how they should act. I took issue with that. Um, but then I also went on a trip with my friend and kissed a stranger, <laughs> which um, was totally like, it, it's hard to describe like how wrong that is in Zenos's eyes. Um, <clears throat> but that kind of like brought me to just like walking on eggshells with people. I was ready. It was like when I turned the corner, there was going to be another person that was there to admonish me and tell me how wrong it was that I kissed somebody. Um, I mean, I was being confronted like morning, noon and night. Like my roommates would wake me up and tell me like how wrong I was for doing that. But then I also just realized like I'm an adult now and I've been living in a ministry house for 10 years at this point. I was 26 
And I was like, this is just weird. This is so weird. I don't have a room to myself. I have all these roommates. This house is disgusting. It's filthy. Like I was just, you know, I felt crowded, like all the things. And I didn't want to bring any of my friends there. And I was like, I don't want to live here anymore. And by expressing that, that's when people really snapped, I think. Like, um, it was, yeah, it was just like all of my friends, even my close friends, like just started panicking and making it about themselves and, uh, weren't willing to listen to me at all or have my best interests at heart. And I was, I just realized like, I am being controlled and this is torture being admonished all the time for wanting normal things. Um, I think that the shutdown too was actually really helpful because I was unemployed for a certain amount of time and it actually gave me time to like slow down and think. Um, I mean, I was living with 10 women in a house with like three bedrooms and one bathroom. And before people would wake up, I would work out and then leave the house for like a three to four hour long walk just to get out of that crowded house and breathe. And I think that it honestly helped, um, me evaluate like how I was being treated, um, but yeah, I, when I left, I didn't initially call it a cult, um, because it's all I knew my entire life, but the only way I could describe what I was going through to people was by saying it feels like I left a cult. You've got the two layers working in conjunction with one another as well. You've got the overarching church itself and the congregation that you would, you would visit, you know, as a child growing up with your parents You've also got the kind of self-sealing communal environment with the 24-hour surveillance, the little amount of sleep, the constant breathing down your neck and telling you how you should do things to the letter to the point where it's taken you a couple of years to unlearn that need for leadership to tell you what the right thing to do is or how you should do things or what time you should do things which right. is pretty significant because you you've got when you've got those two things working together apart from a job that outside of that church there's really nothing else that can take you out of that and when you finally decided to leave the communal home did you leave the church in conjunction or were you still going to some of the meetups and services? Because there's that, that other layer to consider. When I left, my intention was to go to an adult group because it was just very obvious that I was not welcome in the college group anymore um, for wanting these normal things. But then I visited a few of the adult groups and that's when it started to settle in that okay this is not just in the group that I experienced this is not just situational there's been some real serious damage and abuse that's happened that I need to heal from and so I didn't like, like I said, the, the decision to leave was more of a panicked trauma response. I didn't think through it. I didn't think through the fact that I would be in conflict with my friends or anything. And so I, yeah, I convinced myself, oh, I'll just get my own place. I'll go to a different group. But then as I started going to those groups, I was like, this is way deeper than I actually think it is. And all of the consequences that I didn't think through about distancing myself from that environment started to pop up. And I stopped going to church and went to therapy instead. <laughs> so go into these other meetups and, and these other settings you're realizing that the feelings that you had in the communal home are just following you to every dwell environment no matter where it is or who it's with right and I think that you know in so in dwell 
the popular opinion is that the college group is where the thrust of the abuse occur occurs. That's even acknowledged within the organization itself. Um, they wouldn't call it abuse though, but, um, it's definitely where the leadership has the most control over its members because not only are they in communal living houses, which are run by the leaders, but they're also just going to so many events that there's like no time where they're not being controlled or watched. And so when I went to an adult group, I kind of thought that I wouldn't run into the same issues, but I did. And, um, and it was also just too triggering for me that there are many people in dwell who are, are in the adult group who think that the abuse, that they don't perpetuate the abuse, that they don't, uh, that they don't agree with what's going on in the college group, but they're separate from that because they're not in the college group. But I think that that's actually like a very problematic perspective because you're still part of the problem. You're still supporting the people who are perpetuating the problem. And so therefore I think that you are perpetuating it as well. Like by, by believing that this is the only place that you can be that no other, like that the abuse others have suffered is not as valuable as, as you being in like the best church of all time. Like that's a really selfish perspective and a really like, I don't know what the word is, but I'm just like, you want to follow God, then go somewhere else where like hundreds of people aren't reporting abuse. Just because you're in a different branch of that doesn't mean that you're not part of the problem. Like you're still essentially worshiping these leaders and giving them that okay stamp that what's going on in the church is totally fine to cover up and pretend like it's not happening. Even though you left the communal home or or the cho- the, the, the college group, um, and said to friends and family, "Oh, I'm I'm sticking around. I'm just going to go to some different things." What was that inner conflict like for you when you realized that you were going to have to tell your friends and family, "Oh, actually, no. I need to just. I have to just get out." Like like a a trauma response, as you said, there is yeah. often what people have ex- explained on the show as being life or death. Uh, their body is telling them, um. You've you've pushed all this stuff down for so long that your body is then telling you if you don't get out of this situation, you are not going to exist much longer. Um, and that's a very real thing. And I think that's a good way to put it too. I mean, I've read since I left about the kind of psychological, physical, emotional effects of the type of abuse that I suffered, and. Um, it's like, it's textbook. I mean, basically to answer your question, as I told people, I had more faith in them than I should have. Um, I mean, people, even some of my closest friends told me that it wasn't abuse or that it wasn't trauma that I experienced. Um, which is why I kind of did some of that, that research to be like, no, it was, I was right. Um, (laughs) you're actually just gaslighting me. Um, but yeah, like my friends and even my parents became panicked, unreasonable, defensive. Um, you know, at first my parents were accepting and like, listened to me, but then they basically told me to, to get over it and stop talking about it. Um, which is just par for the course in that community. It's like, you just pretend like everything's fine. Everyone's harmonious. Like you don't dwell on the past. You just move on. And, and I don't want to do that. (laughs) Like, this is such a, you know, now, now as I'm living my life two years later, it's only been two years later, but I've grown so much. I've learned so much. I want to share my story. I want to help people. It's not something that I think defines who I am, but it's something that I am able to talk about as part of who I am, part of my story. Um, but yeah, people were, were largely very unsupportive and, um, I had to consider for the first time what friendship is, what friendship means, what boundaries mean, uh, how to practice them and have kind of, uh, curated, um, 
a, a, a wonderful, compassionate um, group of friends who are my family. And that was hard to do because I had to cut some people out, at least for now. But the, the people that I have supporting me now are like more than I could ever ask for. These are people outside of Dwell? Yes. Some of them left before I did and we've reconnected, which is really wonderful because we can process together. But um, others are old coworkers or, um, yeah, old friends um, that I reconnected with since I left. How do people outside of Dwell take it when you open up to them about these experiences that you've had? (laughs) The funny thing is that most people that I've shared this with already know, because like I said, um, Dwell is is very widely known for being a cult in Columbus. So if I mention I was in a really high control environment or I was in a cult or I went to Xenos, people immediately know. They already know. Um, And they're typically pretty interested, I would say, for the most part about what my experience was, which is nice. Um, And I think that they can tell that I'm like a pretty normal person now. So they're not like, scared of me or anything but but yeah I've had a lot of people who um have been willing to kind of be and get informed for me which is really really cool so now at this point you've detached yourself from the movement and found your own place what was it like living in a quieter environment? Because I bet that was something that took some getting used to as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was crazy. I The first couple of months, I would be sitting in my own apartment and be like, something's wrong. What's going on? And then I was like, oh, it's just it's just quiet. <laughs> I just have privacy for the first time. I've never known what that's like. <laughs> um so yeah, it was strange, but in a in a good way. I mean, I got my first uh, adult sized bed as a twenty six year old, and loved decorating my apartment and having people over. And um, but yeah, the the privacy and the freedom was so weird getting used to, especially the freedom part. Like it, it's taken me a really long time to not feel guilty when I'm resting um, or feel like I should be doing something else or it's wrong of me to just, you know, relax. Um, but I mean, it's been really great too. I'm, I'm grateful every single day. Like I love my apartment so much. Um, been like trying to, you know, I've been figuring out who I, who I really am learning how to trust myself and, honor my intuition and uh like I said before like try to figure out what it looks like to have real friendships um which my friends have been incredibly patient with me um in that area because I've definitely had a lot of trial and error um but yeah I I don't know I mean I I'd say like my my community has been the the biggest thing that has helped me grow through all of this I think that the experience of leaving is is very different for multiple different people um I found it very peaceful to have free time I have another friend who just got really anxious and tried to fill all of his time with hanging out with new friends um and got kind of burnt out by that but it was uh an interesting transition initially for sure and you have friends over to visit your place now. You're proud to bring them around and show them all of your your space and all of your personal belongings. Oh, I'm so proud. It's I like I said, it's one of my favorite things ever. Like my apartment, the way I've decorated it. Um, it's it's definitely like my sanctuary and my safe haven. So um my when my friends come in, they just know that my space is just screams Emma it's very me and they I love seeing them like be relaxed in it and um yeah I don't know after living in a communal living house coming straight from my parents house it's the first space I've had to myself and I'm taking full advantage of it for sure so do you have any plans to maybe write about your experiences or to 
go traveling or further education or other things that perhaps you thought were not possible for you when you had committed everything to the church? I'm kind of still trying to figure out what my future will look like. Um, my friends always ask me if I if I will write something about my experiences because I I love writing. I'm I'm a good writer. Um, but um, I don't I don't know yet. Like we've been talking about, I'm only two years out. I mean, two years feels like forever to some degree, but I think I still am learning a lot. Um, so I, I definitely want to continue to use my own story to help other people, but also speaking out of my own story has been really helpful for me as well. Um, there was so much gaslighting that went on inside of dwell that I, that leaving, I really doubled, uh, I really second guessed myself of what, if what I experienced was abuse or like if it was actually just all my fault. (laughs) And so sharing it in platforms like this, sharing my story in platforms like this has really solidified my experience and just helped me realize like what I did see here feel, um, happened and, and it's not a lie. It's not false. It's not, you know, um, me having some sort of agenda, it's actual history and it's actual fact and people can argue against that, but like, I'm sharing my story in a way that, you know, kind of makes it part of history. And it's been really empowering for me. I think that's a, an awesome answer. And I wonder if that's the same sort of advice that you might offer to others in similar positions around taking time to go for walks and taking time to research and read things to understand what you've been through in order to process all of those experiences. Is there anything else you might add to that? Yeah. I mean, I really, I really want other people to share their, their stories too. I'm happy to share mine, but part of sharing mine is in the hopes that other people feel empowered or feel like they have the, the courage to share their own stories too. I think that it can be intimidating coming from a group that's still functioning in um a, a pretty evangelical environment too like it's easy to just kind of brush our stories aside and be like well other people's other people experience this or you know this group is still here so I'll get backlash from this which I have but but I do want other people to share their stories in in the understanding of just you don't have to come from a a super infamous cult to have your story be significant um you know I think part of me me sharing these things is is to communicate that anybody can be in a cult you know like especially in Columbus Ohio like your neighbor your friend your coworker, like Xenos people are everywhere (laughs) and I think that that's the case like around the world unfortunately is like be informed be prepared because you could be recruited, but also like everybody's stories are very valuable. Um, but it's not the right time for everybody either. I mean, some of the biggest lessons I've learned are like, just to be patient with myself, like give myself time to grieve and heal and, um, to allow myself to feel my feelings and accept them. Like it's not everybody's time to tell their story, but yeah, my hope is that people do eventually. I love that too. Really powerful messages around encouraging people to share their stories, but understanding that people should do it when they feel it's right. Maybe that's two years out. Maybe that's never. And But we should never underestimate the power of people coming forward to tell their stories. I have emails every week that people send me to tell me that other people's testimonies have been the catalyst for them to leave their own group. And Mm. I think that's wonderful. So you really can't underestimate what telling your story, either on a podcast or in a blog post or in a book or on the radio or however you decide to do it, it could really change one life, hundreds of lives, 
the organization itself feeling like it has to rebrand and kick out leadership and replace them with people that are even worse. And I really love what you've talked about today in in introspectively almost about how you recognize that things are difficult. You're still having to unlearn things and you probably will have to for a, a long time and how there are things that you have to battle with and things that still trigger you. But also on the flip side of that, understand how much fuller your life is now and how great the experiences are and the friendship groups and all of the living space that you have and autonomy and the you know the 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 surveillance is is turned off and I think that's wonderful so thank you so much for coming on the show Emma for sharing your experience with your experiences with us and being one of those people that won't stand by and be complicit in the abuse of others being one of the people that says actually it's not good enough to just say well I'm not a part of that part of the church so I'm not part of the abuse because the cycle of abuse can only break when people step out of the repetitive practices that they're involved in and I think it's extremely brave for you to come forward after short, such a short amount of time and say that part of me that needs to speak out is ready to do that so I'm going to start doing it I think it's absolutely incredible and uh, and I hope that there are hundreds of more podcasts that invite you onto the show so that you can get your story out there to as many people as possible thank you I'm going to sign off and try and sorry it's been a bit shorter than usual and a bit disrupted but um, it's been so wonderful to talk to you Emma and I really hope that you enjoy the rest of your day yeah you as well thank you take care bye thanks bye that is the end of this mini series on Xenos Christian Fellowship to get in touch with me you can find me at coltvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on twitter and instagram at coltvaultpod I'm your speaker Casey host of the Colt Vault podcast.